So hello, uh, welcome to uh, the Davis Futures Forum. Uh, my name's Brett Lee and I'll be introducing our speaker this evening. Uh, thank you for coming out on a Wednesday evening, uh, appreciate it. Um, our speaker, Paula Daniels, is currently co-founder and chair of the board of the Center for Good Food Purchasing, a nonprofit entity that encourages public and private institutions to purchase sustainably grown food. She was the food policy advisor to Los Angeles Mayor Villaraigosa and has held academic appointments at UCLA, UC Berkeley, and the Vermont School of Law. Um, and so I'd like to welcome uh, Paula Daniels uh, to come and uh, speak with us this evening. Hi, sorry about that. I, I'm not very good at operating PowerPoint slides, but I think it's ready to go now, so thank you very much. I'm so happy to be here, and I really appreciate um, the invitation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, Judy. Where is Judy? Um, for organizing all of this. She's, been, she's a really wonderful ambassador and organizer, and Dima as well. Um, and I appreciate that you all came tonight to find out about this work. Um, it's something that I've moved toward is something that it's obviously pretty vital to a lot of us, um, and I'm happy to be invited here to talk about what we did in Los Angeles and what we're now doing that was a program of the Food Policy Council that spread nationally. But I thought I'd start by just sort of talking about, you know, why uh, we got involved in all this. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the changes we're seeing in our world. Um, and what we're seeing is the role that food and the food system plays in that and how it can play a role in reforming things for the 21st century. So this slide you'll see is a quote from Jonathan Foley and it's fairly recent. So he's the president of the California Academy of Sciences or the head of it. And he says things that a lot of us have known for a while. In the 1970s, there was a book called Future Shock by Alvin Toffler that I remember reading and thinking uh, the, pre the premise of it was that the world's changing exponentially fast. And I, at the time when the book came out in the 70s, I thought, wow, it couldn't ever be any faster than it is right now. <laughs> Little did I know. And for those of you who are younger than me, you you may not get it, but it, trust me, it's really an issue that in a single lifetime, so much more change has happened than in all of human history combined. So there's a lot that we're grappling with in terms of what our world is about and how we affect change in it when things are moving so fast. And one of the things that I think is really critical to think about is how our current world is designed and why it needs like an update. And the way I think of it is like, I've been remodeling my home that was built in the 60s. We might need to remodel a few things that were built in the 60s in the middle part of the 20th century and some of that is our major infrastructure. So just think of the way, I mean, I'm from Los Angeles. So Los Angeles is a 20th century city. It's completely designed in the 20th century, really. I mean, it was founded earlier than that, but its rapid growth came in a time when there was an automobile. So it was designed around the automobile, and it has that hardwire infrastructure of the freeway. So many of our transportation systems were designed in that time, too. But what else that is really fundamental and shapes how we live was designed in that same time frame? So, uh, whoops, I skipped over something. So uh, I guess you can guess wh where I'm headed with this, but what do you think these two things have in common? Obviously, when they were designed, but before I go to the next slide to point that out, uh, let me explain what these pictures are. So on the right is the California um, aqueduct. It's part of the state water project. So our water system. So in addition to our transportation systems, our major water system was designed in the mid 20th century. On the left, you all recognize that logo, right? But guess where I, I took that picture personally? In Berlin in 2014. Now let me tell you where I took it. I was in Berlin just four years ago, and I was in this, gourm, this store called Karabe, which is, if you've been there, it's a, like Harrods or Nordstrom's or Neiman Marcus. It's a high-end department store. It has eight stories. And on the top floor is their gourmet food section. <laughs> I kid you not. So it was the gourmet food section. They had international foods from around the world. So you go to the French section, and you get these beautiful mustards, and you get these wines and these vinegars. You go to the Italian section, and you have a lot of artisanal stuff. So I'm eager to see what the representation is of the United States. And this, I kid you not, was it. So it was Pop-Tarts. It was Jello. It was stuff that we don't really, I mean, they're still on our shelves, but 
it, it was our cultural representation to the rest of the world in Germany. Stunning to me. So I only took a few pictures. I should have taken a panorama of the whole thing. But, but when were Pop-Tarts, uh, I think a lot of us might remember, I certainly do, but when, when were they developed? Pop-Tarts first came out. Why is this going so fast? I'm sorry, I think I pressed it too hard. Pop-Tarts first uh, were designed in 1964 and 1963. That's uh, President Pat, uh, sorry, Governor Pat Brown and the Oroville Dam, the state water project, the very first development of that. But these are old systems. Our food system is an artifact of that time. It's an old system needing upgrade. Oroville Dam clearly needs an upgrade. I think you all know about know that story. So what else happened? What were some of the other drivers of what was happening uh, during that time? And I just think it's worth pegging it to think about, you know, what what were the po why were the policies developed the way they were? So, uh, 20th century California, and mid 20th century was. Let's see if this works. I'm not seeing it work. Okay. <laughs> Here's a picture of early 20th century California, Los Angeles. Anybody want to guess where that is? Anybody know LA? What's that? Pretty close. I mean, can you see the hills in the background? Hollywood Hills, yeah. This is Western Avenue, what became Western Boulevard. So that's the, just the turn of the 20th century. So the amazing thing to me is that they're wearing bicycles and that the women are wearing skirts and bicycling and they're going somewhere, I don't know where. But the point is, obviously we know we overlaid a lot onto what was not a very abundant uh, landscape in terms of water availability, or you, what you don't see are cars, but you also don't see any trees, right? So, so we did a lot in the 20th century. That's 1892, California. Um, in uh, starting, you know, toward 1948 is when McDonald's hamburgers were started. Uh, Disneyland, 1955, the year I was born. I'm gonna date myself on purpose. Um, so you can, I'll be talking about 1955 in a second. Oroville Dam, which we talked about before. These are some of the big things that shaped our society and uh, how we run government, which was, this is Howard um, Jarvis, 1978, and Prop 13 was passed. These are some big things that started sh you know, making changes in what our policy infrastructure is, as well as our hardwired water and other structures. And Disney had a big cultural influence, obviously, in 1955. So that's kind of how we got here. And then, but what here means in terms of the food system is that, um, sorry, I, I think I just have to have a lighter touch. Um, not only do we have a lot of problems in term, you know, which we'll go over in a second, but we have a lot of cardiometabolic disorders from our food system. Um, I'm not sure if I need to explain that to you all, but a lot of uh, obesity and uh, what is the word, it's called, we're calling it diabetes, diabetes and obesity, you know, combined, but mostly in lower income communities. Um, we also have a lot of agricultural impacts from our food system, just the water use alone. This is, which was done by Bloomberg, New, uh, Bloomberg uh, quite some time ago, but the water use to produce beef, as you can see, very high. There's also a lot of, um, food that goes into it and it produces quite a lot of carbon. So there's a lot of impacts from what we've decided to do and what our cultural preferences are regarding food, particularly the consumption of beef and meat in this in this country and the impacts that that has. Yeah, that one's hard to read, I'm sorry, but the others will be easier. Okay, great. There's also, you know, this issue that, that we're all grappling with in terms of climate change and the uh, greenhouse gas emissions by sector. Um, this is from the United States EPA. It's still up on their website, and um, you can see that agriculture, um, forestry, and other land uses, but it's primarily agriculture, are responsible for 24% of greenhouse gas emissions. It's the largest sector in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there's a lot of other issues relative to um, environmental impacts of agriculture, nitrate runoff, things like that. So there's a, there's a lot of consequences to producing those Pop-Tarts, which are a real, f it's, a, it's an artifact of our 20th, mid part of the 20th century. Um, the drivers, and again, 1955, um, the year 
the year I was born, uh, so mid part of the century. Before then, um, the lowest income Americans had the healthiest diets. Why? Because they were mostly uh, producing their own food. They had victory gardens. They weren't as tied into a very globally industrialized, efficient food system. Um, uh, the diabetes I talked about, which is that combination of uh, obesity and diabetes, um, more prevalent now in low-income Americans. It, here you can see the difference in the obesity rate, 12% uh, than 60%. Uh, part of a lot of this is the consolidation in the food system that is then trends toward um, providing profits and efficiency. Um, so chicken production is an example. There used to be 36 companies involved in it. Now there's just three in chicken production. And it's, you I probably know who they are, Tyson's being one of them. L.A. County before 1955 was the largest, largest agriculturally producing county in the country. In the country? I know it doesn't produce much at all now. This is its rank. Um, we've lost farming and farmers. So farmers used to be, um, the workforce used to be significant in agriculture before 1955, and now it's under 2%. So again, what does that mean? It's consolidated, it's efficient, it's mass produced, but what are the outputs from that? Um, and there are less farms, but more being produced from those farms. Um, so. How do we change it, right? So uh, what, what examples can we look to? And in a lot of ways, when you look to the future and trying to think of what you can do next, um, as Peter Drucker would say, a man of the mid-20th century, um, he's a very well-known management expert, and there's a school in Claremont Colleges that's named after him. Um, but, you know, a lot of times when you're thinking about how do you want to plan for something, you say what's most likely to happen, but what he advocates for is accounting for uncertainties, because we're living in an uncertain time, right? So we have climate change. Um, when Oroville Dam was uh, built, they were probably looking at, well, how do we hold this much water? But they weren't accounting for some changes. They weren't accounting for uncertainty and other sorts of risks they didn't really know about. So his, uh, he advocates that what do you think um, has already happened that might create the future. And let me give you an example of how that might come into play in terms of how we can think about how we move our food system forward. And I'm going to talk about air. So this, again, we're going back to 1950, you know, the mid-20th century, the year, you know, around the time that McDonald's and Disneyland were created. Right around that time, huge crisis in terms of air pollution. Um, this is a picture of the City Hall of Los Angeles in 1948. The air pollution was really bad. When I moved to L.A. in 1973, air quality was notoriously bad there. Um, my sister went to school at Scripps. Um, we moved from Hawaii, and, you know, I went there. She went to Scripps, and I remember she was on the track team, and she couldn't run because she couldn't breathe very well. But it was bad then, but worse beforehand. How many of you watched The Crown? Have you seen that? So do you remember the episode with Winston Churchill and the smog? They were all struggling with. This was a worldwide problem, was, was air quality. They also did not really know what it came from right away. And if you watch that episode of The Crown where Winston Churchill is running around, people are dying. They're dying of uh, you know, breathing problems in the hospitals, and they're crashing into each other. And people are saying, you know, maybe this comes from coal emissions. And he goes, no, nah, it's just weather. You know, it's just an oddity of weather. Uh, and he had to be convinced that something needed to be done about that. Well, I mean, we were in, that, we were in the same situation um, here in, in the United States. There's a picture on the right. Again, this is like, it's in 1954. It's of the Optimists Club, <laughs> um, the Huntington Park Optimists Club. And they're wearing gas masks. I don't know if you can see it. And they go, why wait till 1955? We may not get there. So they were pretty feeling pretty doomed by what the air quality was like back then. But what did we do? How did we fix that? Again, that's the air quality then. We actually did research. Um, and we started uh, in California. We were the first place to really apply research and some governmental attention to trying to address the problem. So um, they established an air pollution control district in Los Angeles. Um, a Caltech researcher, and this was the big breakthrough, found that the smog was coming from automobile emissions, in, at least in California. And then there was further research um, and to, to get more specific about it, but then they did regulations. Auto emissions control technology was mandated, um, and then tailpipe emission standards came actually in the mid-20th mid century. And now this is Los Angeles. 
um, is the air. And I actually realized lately we've, we've gotten used to the fact that we have actually really good air quality in Los Angeles, and a lot of that has to do with our air quality control boards and the work they've been doing to, to tackle emissions. So they figured out what it was. They came up with a solution. Another example, uh, this is from when I was in college, so the lines, some of you may remember this. There was an oil scarcity, and there were lines, and you could only get gas on alternate days because they were trying to ration it. Uh, so that actually promoted, a combined with air quality issues and the scarcity of oil, that actually promoted our renewable energy push starting in the 70s. Now, starting on a national level, um, Carter actually uh, passed a law that's opened up um, energy production to independent producers. The idea was to promote solar and to promote other forms of renewable, en energy, renewable energy. The next president came in was Ronald Reagan, felt differently about things, reversed all of that. So the federal level started going back and forth on renewable energy. What happened? And this is why I think it's analogous to the food system. Regions took over. We started developing renewable portfolio standards. Those are regional. What I remember in Los Angeles when I was in the mayor's office was that we had a goal of 20% by 2020, and we arrived at that target by thinking about what, how we could produce energy in a different way, how we could organize our policies around that, how we could promote uh, job production in the economy and, and create incentives and so forth, and we hit our target. And you know how successful California has been in that in general. Um, and obviously this is where we are with renewable energy now. So my premise is we can do the same in food and I think it has to start on a regional level. Um, so that's why I started the LA Food Policy Council. A lot of it had to do with the fact that I've been involved in water policy and I was looking at the connection between water and food. That was my driver also being from Hawaii. When I was born, Hawaii was at a time of peak sugar. When my dad was born, i uh, sorry, of peak pineapple. When my dad was born, Hawaii was at a time of peak sugar. So Hawaii was an agricultural economy but agriculture was leaving Hawaii. And you know we started becoming a tourist economy, but Hawaii cannot produce enough food to feed itself. So the uh, problem there is if the ships stop going to Hawaii, because it's 85 to 90% of their foods imported, Hawaii would be out of food in a week. With climate change, two hurricanes came very close to Hawaii last year. People had to shelter in place. The stores were stripped bare of food. And if they're really, and cargo ships were quite literally ordered away. So it's not hypothetical, it was real, away from the ports. So Hawaii's looking very much at trying to produce a regional food system for themselves again. So uh, Los Angeles Food Policy Council, I'm gonna pause on this slide for a second to show you um, uh, what it, this actually was done by a student at Berkeley uh, who's in geography who wants to map things out. But each one of those squares um, represents different organizations that were participating in the food system in different ways that we brought together. And we did this because we had a lot of folks working in different areas in the food system up to that point in time. We were disaggregated and kind of siloed. A lot of the function of you know, the design of the 20th century in terms of infrastructure was actually working in terms of how we dealt with issues. We all started specializing quite a bit, but that meant that we, weren't, we were working at the ends of the problem, but not necessarily upstream to the root causes of the problem. Right? And a lot of the root causes were policy and economics. So we wanted to bring folks together uh, to work together around how can we really create a robust regional food economy that would help address some of these issues. Um, so we started pulling them together, and I'll talk to you in a second about how. But these were what we found were where the groups were working in different areas um, that we all pulled together over time. So just you know, a little bit of history. I started doing it in, in uh, 2009. Um, putting together a task force to look at, um, and this was uh, uh, issued by directive of the mayor, Mayor Villaraigosa, um, to develop a food policy framework um, for the region and to look at whether or not we should have a food policy council, because it wasn't a foregone conclusion. So we formed a sh uh, task force, announced it at a farmer's market celebration, the celebration of uh, 30th anniversary of farmer's markets, and what better time to announce a policy than then? because farmers markets were about supporting small farms, but also bringing food to low-income communities. That was the idea of farmers markets in LA. So how do you get that to a bigger scale? So it's not uh, you know, serving some farmers, some people, but serving the region um, was what we were trying to get at. So we did our work, we started um, the Food Policy Council and had some programs adopted. I was moved over into the mayor's office 
and then it's now um, become something that is continuing to survive. So that's an overall snapshot of its trajectory. But I want to tell you a little bit about how it got started. You know, so we pulled the task force together. It was 20 folks across the food system spectrum, deliberately only 20 because we were going to write a report. Um, many of you may know how challenging it is to write a report by committee. But <laughs> we, so we wanted 20 people who would tackle the report, but we also held quite a few listening sessions. So over the course of our time, which is about 10 months, from the time we convened to the time we produced a report, we had many listening sessions, urban rural roundtables, um, worked with a number of communities, identified a number of communities. All told, we talked to hundreds of people and, and funneled that in through the task force, which was representative of uh, every critical point along the food system spectrum, from production to supply chain businesses to advocacy groups that deal with hunger issues and academics and so forth. And, but we started with a definition of what we were aiming toward. And what we were aiming toward was to have LA be a good food region. And what did that mean? This was the definition we arrived at. It was borrowed from the Kellogg Foundation definition, but it was healthy, affordable, fair, and sustainable was um, how we defined it and continue to define it. So it's, it's addressing all those areas. Um, and this was the report that we issued. So it had... Um, 55 action steps, actually, which we boiled down to, to six priority areas, um, which you can see there yourself, but a lot of it had to do with promoting a good food economy and addressing healthy food access through building a, a market for good food, ad addressing hunger, um, urban agriculture was really key. Um, and then we did recommend that there should be a food policy council, which is actually not an easy decision, I have to say, because there are quite a few groups working in this area, and in particular in LA, within a larger urban area like that, many of the nonprofit organizations were addressing hunger issues. What we realized we didn't have, though, was a strong connection to the rural economy. We're very urbanized, and our urban border was so far away, LA's 465 square miles, so we didn't have that strong connection. It was something that was, we realized was very important over the course of our sessions. And so ultimately it was decided we needed a food policy council because otherwise we weren't gonna have those deliberate conversations across the food system spectrum. And we'd also brought in a number of businesses um, along the supply chain. So this was a place where we could all meet and figure out how we were gonna address these issues. So we formed a food policy council and this is the structure. Um, and th this was, uh, how it was as of the time I left the mayor's administration. So um, you can see we didn't see it as hierarchical. That's pretty key right there. Um, we saw it as radiant. We saw it as everybody playing a role, and there was the center of it, but then it extended out to our network. So there's no boss here. It's more that we were moving a big wheel, and we were the center of that, all the spokes of the wheel. So in the center of it was staff. I, did, um, I was leading it, I led the formation of it, I recruited the board and put the structure together, but I hired staff right away. And then we um, were able to recruit additional staff. So by the time I left, we had about eight uh, staff. And then um, we had a leadership board, which was the core decision-making group. And that board was 40, um, it's a lot, but it was you know, meant to be representative of the food system spectrum, so our decision was to have two from each sector, uh, no more than two, but two, so that you know, if one person couldn't come, another person would, but also not just um, representative of that entity, but that person had to come and couldn't send a replacement, because we wanted to have continuity from each meeting. So we had two farmers, uh, two along the supply chain. We had two from uh, anchor institutions, LA Unified School District Food Service. We had the County Department of Public Health. Part of the reason, I'm gonna stop there for a second, part of the reason we formed it as a collaborative entity was because the city and county of LA are not the same. They're, it's very unique. The city's one entity, county's another entity. In many places, you have a combined city and county government. I think most places are like that. Um, maybe not here, but we had a separate city and county, so we did not have the health department. We did not have control over um, SNAP or food stamps or CalFresh. That was all with the county. So some of the, and we did not have control over the school district. So the mayor couldn't, by executive order, bring the relative relevant departments together. San Francisco had actually created a food policy council, and that was done by executive order of Gavin Newsom, who was mayor at the time. But um, he was able to do that because all the departments were under his purview. 
even if we could have done that, I wouldn't have wanted to do it by executive order. I, 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 we thought it'd be best to, to create an entity that ultimately would be a nonprofit and survive on its own past any administration, um, which is what we did. So that it, it, it could be populated with and ultimately guided by somebody other than someone in the administration, although having a connection to it. So we also had the county health department, we had um, Whole Foods, um, and we had a number of NGOs. So, so every issue area represented as only two. That's the leadership board in, this, in the middle. But then there were a lot of people who were interested in other issues. We had about 150 people interested in urban agriculture. But so we didn't want to, we wanted them represented. We had urban agriculture in the uh, governance board. But if we had everybody there who was interested in urban agriculture, then maybe that would be the only thing we would take on. And we knew there were a lot of things we wanted to challenge um, from the 55 action steps that we had developed. We knew there was more than that. So we created a working group structure, which you could think of sort of like subcommittees. Initially, we were thinking of it as a subcommittee of the board. So every board member was part of and initially chaired a working group, and ultimately the working group then elected its own chair, which happened. Um, so we did still have 150 people in the Urban Act working group that came up with a set of recommendations. I think we had only eight people in the Good Food Economy group, but they came up with a set of recommendations that was pretty key. So it didn't matter how many, as long as they came up with a set of recommendations that came to the board, the board approved. And then because we would have meetings and we'd have hundreds of people showing up, our first meeting we had 80 people, the next we had 90, then we had 120, we started getting 200, we had a lot of people showing up. Um, and not everybody wanted to work on a working group, but they wanted to learn what was going on, we created the network. And that's the broader circle on the outside. And that's where we would have sessions a lot like this one. You know, we'd have different topics um, that we would bring up, panel discussions and so forth for the network. If people wanted to get involved, and become part of a working group, they would work their way into it. And I have to sp say for a second, after I was talking about this to a class, like my structure, the structure we created, and I stopped and I looked at that, that you know what? That is actually like Congress. I didn't realize it at the time, but think about it. You have the Senate, which is two from each state. I had two from each issue area. And then you had the Congress, which is representative based on population. I had the issue groups based on interests. I mean, I went, God, if that isn't just a model that kind of works. I didn't even realize it at the time. But then I went, geez, that's, yeah. So why not? You know, so you can have a balance, uh, you know, checks and balances against each other. So it became a very fluid decision-making process that worked really well, and I'll explain that right now because I want to tell you what we developed in terms of programs. Um, so we had a number of programs that we did. We did actually address street vending. We did address urban agriculture in the medians. Street vending came out of a working group that ultimately it was passed. It was a, a, a wonderful organizing effort that uh, was passed uh, just last week. But our key programs that were meant to really start making that 21st century upgrade to our food system were these three interlocking programs. One was, I'm sorry, that's light, but one was a good food purchasing program, which I'll talk about more, um, to build the market for good food. The other was to build the supply chain, Compra Foods, and then in terms of equitable access, the healthy neighborhood um, markets. Um, so just quickly on the healthy neighborhood market, um, that's community market conversions to help small markets, which are more prevalent in low-income communities, source and sell healthy food. Because the issue is that only mostly junk food is available in low-income communities because it's cheap, right? So this is a, a conversion in progress. Um, but an issue for them is that they have a hard time accessing produce. Like it's very easy for them to get uh, drop-offs from Coca-Cola and Nestle's and Kraft because they have their capillary structure in terms of delivery and they'll take an order and fulfill it. And so that's why you have a lot of junk food in low-income communities. It just makes it easy for them. These are small business owners, um, but it's very hard for them to source and sell healthy produce. They often buy it from supermarkets and then mark it up and it's already old by the time they get it because it's been in a supermarket and handled a lot. So what we looked at was trying to build some way to um, get them healthy food and, um, sorry, and, th and that was Compra Foods, which is um, um, cooperative purchasing for the markets. So the, they will, Compra Foods will go to the terminal market and act as their intermediary and get food at a wholesale price for them according to their orders and provide it to them so that they can sell it. 
um, in their stores at a price and it's fresher and they have more of it. So that works pretty well. And we also have the Healthy Neighborhood Market Network training. So it's a peer group and that has really amplified their ability to do um, that work because they're learning from each other. The small business, the Healthy Food Neighborhood Market Network around the, um, the city and it's really amplifying the program quite a bit. We use our board to teach them. So we use the Whole Foods executives to teach them. We use a lot of other folks to teach them. And then we have the Good Food Purchasing Program, which is where I am now. And that actually was adopted in LA in 2012. And I'm gonna, I wanna talk to you about it because it's a, our key program in terms of procurement. I do see I'm running a little short on time, I'm sorry, but so I'll try and go through this really fast. But one thing I wanna mention to you is that um, it was adopted in 2012 by uh, the city of LA and LA Unified School District. And I was in Rome uh, in October to get an award for this program, for its adoption in 2012, that was given to us by the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, the World Future Council, and IFOM Organics International. It was for that act of adopting this program. We got the Future Policy Award of 2018 for scaling up agroecology. We were the only program in the United States to be given that award. And it, they had looked at international policies from around the world, quite a few of them, and there were only eight that won overall, and that we were the only one from the US. So what is this thing? Um, I'm switching slides here because the logo shifted. This was, this was what it looked like when we were part of the LA Food Policy Council. Because it got so much attention, we spun it off into its own program and its own entity called the Center for Good Food Purchasing, which was um, created in 2015. Um, and since we created, it's expanded quite a bit. Um, but we did it because we understand the, um, the, the purchasing power is key. This is a, a quote from the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, who issued a report in 2014 supporting food policy councils and decentralizing and regionalizing food. Um, so again, that's the 21st century upgrade, but also procurement, as, the, as he says, very few source of leverage, but government and its purchasing power can be a very key source. So we designed it to have five core values. The short version of how it works is it's like lead certification, but it works for food purchasing in major institutions. And it has the five co-equal values of supporting local economies, uh, fair labor, animal welfare, environmental sustainability, and public health. And we had, again, a huge two-year research process. While we were part of the Food Policy Council, we researched had a stakeholder process, a lot of review of this. Um, an example, LA County Department of Public Health wrote our nutrition program. NRDC participated in the environmental sustainability piece. Farmers participated in the local economy piece, and, and et cetera. Um, within the first year of its adoption by LA Unified School District, and this is in part why we got the award, I'm sure, because this immediate change. LA Unified School District, $150 million food budget a year. They were, prior to adopting our program, sourcing less than 10% of their produce locally. Within one year, 60% was sourced locally. It redirected $12 million into the local food economy. It created 150 jobs all in a year because they hadn't really thought about it before. They had been thinking about nutrition, but they hadn't been thinking about their impact on the food system. This program helped them not only think about it, but helped them figure out how to direct their purchases that way. We get their food purchasing dollars, look at it at the farm level, have a point system. We analyze it, rate it, and reflect it back to them in a point score and in a star rating. So that was one of the big differences. The jobs came from local food processing you know, for the, the additional produce. Um, and then they started also uh, directing more sustainable purchasing, uh, reformulation of bread and so forth. It's a 13 billion program. I was gonna show you a video, but we're completely out of time and I think the audio doesn't work. But we are now in the process of expanding nationally but be and trying to reach more of that, the 13 billion in uh, federal school lunch um, money um, throughout the country. Um, what's happening here? I already talked about that. Um, just a little bit more background on how it works. We have a pretty extensive standards committee that helps us develop the standards. First standards were developed. It's an extensive manuscript document that the school districts follow. Uh, were developed in 2012. We had an upgrade in 2017, and we're going to have another upgrade in another five years we do the upgrades. And these are the institutions, a number of academic, UC Davis is part of it, um, and others, Tufts, uh, other schools around the country, as well as organizations who I think you'll recognize are all part of the input process on that. 
So we have expanded um, after almost the minute after we took it out of Los Angeles into its own entity. We were adopted by Oakland, San Francisco Unified School Districts, and we're now in 14 uh, countries, uh, sorry, cities, <laughs> municipalities around the country and 28 institutions. Uh, we had staff, we have staff in New York today um, that we're presenting to New York. Uh, Chicago adopted it. We have a partnership now with the Urban School Food Alliance, which is the alliance of the um, 11 largest school districts in the country. And what we're doing is analyzing their purchasing. We're now analyzing about $895 million worth of purchasing by municipal institutions and letting them know how they're doing. So back to that question that Peter Drucker asked, and I'll wrap up from here. What you're seeing is something that came, that impact came from a food policy council. It came from a stakeholder group. It came from folks coming together and thinking about how do we do that? How do we remodel our version of the food system? How do we give it that 21st century upgrade? That's what we came up with, and it's making a difference. What I want to suggest to you, though, in terms of being regional, what's happened before that we'll plan for the future. We knew through the Dust Bowl that we needed to take care of our soils. This was the Conservation Act written by Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the 1930s. That was an overly efficient food system that wasn't taking care of its soil that created the Dust Bowl problem. We're kind of at that place again. We've got healthy soils initiatives, but what's gonna get us there, I do believe is gonna be regional robustness. It doesn't have to replace the food system. If you think about renewable energy, the goals were 20% by 2020, 30% by 2020. Can we regionally create goals that are like that, that are a village overlay on a global food system? I mean, California does have a goal now of 100% renewable um, by a very ambitious state, and maybe it will get there. Maybe our food system gets to a place where it's 100% regional, but there's a lot of value in the, in the global food system too. So I'm not saying we get off of it completely, but let's set targets that are different than 5%, which is where most of us are right now, which is where Hawaii is right now, which is if we only have 5 to 15%, Hawaii is the stark example of it, but that's true for Los Angeles too, because we so rely on that global system, right? We know that things that are produced here, like Fresno, go elsewhere and don't feed the people in that region. So what are we trying to create? But something that we all used to have, which is villages um, or you know, more renewable energy. It was a natural way of producing things. And while we're not, we're gonna have the benefit of modern technology and modern knowledge, things are moving so fast because we sit on a wealth of knowledge from centuries of learning. And we can combine it all and not disaggregate it. We can combine it and take the best of all of it and create a system that's gonna work for all of us much better. Thank you. So sorry I'm not over. So if uh, Paul is open to this, uh, we'll do a 10 minute period of uh, question and answers. Uh, and then we'll have a, a panel seated where there'll be a panel discussion and then uh, at the end of the panel discussion, there'll be an additional opportunity for questions and answers of the panelists, uh, as well as Paula, if she's uh, open to that. So uh, I see a hand going up here. I'll, I'll just uh, preface this by saying, uh, ideally, uh, your question is relatively brief, so we have more time for Paula to answer the questions. Uh, the reason I mention this is sometimes people uh, take 10 minutes asking the question. Right, so that's not meant to be insulting, it's just an uh, observation that I've had uh, over uh, some of these future forums. So we'll uh, start over here uh, and... Uh, Does your program have anything to do with food waste? And are you familiar with the food shift program in Oakland? Is there anything like that? I am not happening personally here? familiar with the food shift program in Oakland. Some of our staff might be. Some of our staff are in the Berkeley area. But we do have points in our program for food waste. So basically what we're doing, the Good Food Purchasing Program reflects back how they do. But I will say the LA Food Policy Council uh, is very involved in food waste and food waste strategies and helping so to move those ideas So getting food waste to be used and give back to people in need. Yeah, we have members on our Food Policy Council. So now a member of our Food Policy Council board is Rick Namias, who founded Food Forward, which takes unused produce and imperfect produce and donates it to food banks. So that is an element 
of what the Food Policy Council works on. What was it? Could you repeat his name, please? It's Food Forward is what you should remember. It's the group in Los Angeles. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could speak a little more specifically about the fairness in um, workers uh, for the good food purchasing, purchasing program, um, yeah. just because we are in a producing area and yeah. uh, farm workers yeah. are very much part of our economy. Yeah. So I was wondering in terms of what are the standards and what are some incentives to get people to uh, have fair labor practices? Yeah, so the way our standards work um, is that, again, we have the five categories, and in each category we have a baseline level, and, the, and then they must have 15% of their purchases at that level, and then they can there's tiers and they can do better in each category. So I'm going to talk about fair labor, but just to give you an illustration of how that works for local, baseline could be within state. You get more points if it's from within 200 miles and more points if it's from a smallholder farm, USDA definition. So, it's, you can see how the tiers work, right? And so, in other categories, we point towards certifications. So, in environmental, it points toward, it, so we're not trying to reinvent the wheel in terms of you know, what would constitute environmental. What our standards committee does is look at which certifications do we want to use. So, organic is in a tier for um, environmental. So, for labor, the baseline is comply with labor laws. <laughs> which is the right baseline, but I'll, I can talk about it a little bit more, but I want to—I could get wonky on this, so let me do briefly here. But so you can do better by buying from fair trade, um, certified, or union is an option. It doesn't have to be 100% union, but you know that you can have this array of things that Equitable Food Initiative, these certifications that are already involved in fair labor. The baseline, what we do, we do very heavy on analytic staff, which are all graduates with master's degree in public policy, by the way, if anybody's interested, because uh, we're hiring another one right now. That's where we build up our team. So they take the food purchasing data, and then they cross-check against databases. So for fair labor, uh, they will cross-check against OSHA. Everybody knows what OSHA is. And, and fair labor, um, wage and hour violations, et cetera. And so we're cross-checking against, it will even cross-check if somebody's actually organic because certified. So if they say they're organic certified, we double check. So we do a lot of verification. So with labor, we will find that there are violations, right? This happens, like you know, nobody wants to have a moving violation when you drive, but I've had a few. So I'm not saying, you know, it's, but if it's repeat, willful, serious, we will reflect that back um, to the purchasing institution and say this is what we found along your supply chain. Can you write to those suppliers and ask them what they're doing to address this? What that creates is a transparency, right? It's not enforcement per se, but it, that communication starts making a difference. We actually found, because we found a lot of violations with Tyson's, um, that as a result, LAUSD did not renew their contract. So it went to Foster Farms, which is California based. That's a lot of chicken. I'm curious about how um, the Policy Council is addressing uh, land use uh, policy and what kinds of changes um, it's starting to recommend um, yeah. within both the city and maybe county use of land. Um, yeah, I will say honestly that um, we are very urban focused still. You know, we were trying to maintain that connection um, with the rural community. Um, I have moved on to the Center for Good Food Purchasing um, and we have more of an urban focus and a, a real focus on unhealthy food, the markets. The, from the land use standpoint, it was primarily focused on urban agriculture and the urban agriculture incentive, incentive zones and deploying that. There's another level of this that I think is coming, which is to have more involvement from the county. So we're hoping that the county not only adopts the Good Food Purchasing Program, but starts uh, working more closely with us in other aspects of the county than the health department. So the county, LA is 465 square miles. I can't even tell you how many the county is. I should know, but the number's so big, I think my, my brain can't keep it. It's gigantic. I mean, we have 88 cities in the county and it's 12 million people. And they have a lot of land, a lot of agricultural land. So we're influencing the development of their stand, their sustainability plan right now. Um, and so we've played that role in terms of being a, a voice on it. But truthfully, it's not something we focus on as much because of you know the the urgency of the other issues that we've been addressing, just because of the nature of our 
our makeup, but it's something that a food policy council could easily take on. I will tell you in New Orleans, so I advise food policy councils around the country also, and uh, New Orleans is working on a lot of, a lot of those issues. Is it just each one has different array? But it's been incredibly valuable to have a food policy council there. Their government has appointed them as a as just recently it happened this year, as their key policy go to policy advisor for food policy and land use around around agriculture. It's a recent accomplishment for them. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about the efficacy of your programs. Um, so it seems like you should be able to pretty easily uh, look at if there's been substantial reductions in obesity rates or if there's been substantial uh, reductions or improvements in food purchasing decisions, um, especially with some of the cities in the surrounding areas. And I'm wondering yeah. if you've actually seen any substantial changes in uh, health impacts like you led with your presentation or even in food uh -huh. purchasing decisions across Not the Not so easy to address to figure that out because there's a lot of variables in what causes um, cardiometabolic disorders. So we have been uh, talking with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and other health-based organizations about how to construct a longitudinal impact study, but it's, that would take a lot of time. So we have, we do have partnerships with um, university, other academic institutions to try to construct that, but we don't have the data on health impacts. We do, it's more, it's more available us to get economic impacts because you know we can trace that pretty immediately, like the twelve million dollars and the hundred fifty jobs and the, it was not only did we get the report back but we can verify it through a number of sources. But um, we're at the point where we're getting enough information that we're going to start producing some reports. We're hoping next year is what we're looking at because we now have six years of data from LA Unified School District, but the other school districts just came on recently, right? So you need to have a lot of time in one place and have a program working consistently across time to see what those kind of impacts are. So, uh, um, if- I'd be happy to follow up with you afterwards. Yeah, so uh, we'll just uh, have time for two more questions at this stage and then there'll be the panel discussion with also Q&A, so. Uh, Hi, I'm wondering if there were tensions in LA between fair and affordable and sustainable, and if so, how those played out within the council? There were not. <laughs> that was yeah. quick. Uh. Yeah, I mean, I'd be happy to elaborate on that more, because I, I, I think I understand what you're getting at. Does do you, you compromise one while pursuing another? But there were not, because, because we're a big tent coalition, we, and we agreed we're gonna focus on all of them equally, there wasn't a tension. I guess the question would be, for adopting institution, does it compromise their ability to afford to buy the food? Maybe it's a separate question, though. But I don't know if you're asking that yeah, one. Well, the reason we went to large institutions is they have significant purchasing power, and there's purchasing power can shape the economy around it. So the way large institutions buy is they usually buy through a procurement process uh, that's an RFP. So they will set the price parameters, right? It has to be within this amount. So a responsible, responsive, responsible bidder uh, has to bid within that amount. But we also, because they adopted our program, they built us into their RFP and said, it has to be within this amount and you have to comply with the good food purchasing program. So the distributors would go, that were bidding on it, went, Okay, we get our marching orders. So why would they do it? Because you have, why would they agree to bid within that price parameter, which is not huge for a school district, and still do all the rest of this? Because they have volume and a commitment. And that's huge for somebody who's running a business. Guaranteed volume, if you get the contract, five years. And a, lar and a large volume and a long-term commitment. So that, that's why we targeted that area, but also because it's an area where it can have the most change. The school district is the largest food service provider in any region, generally. Hi, Paula. Um, I, you know, first of all, recognizing the scalability or the, the scaling that's part of the strategy of anchor institutions on a, on a national and even potentially international level, but as far as the actual technology itself and the database and tracking systems that you've developed, um, with so many, including our, us as a partner organization working um, with you, 
with many family others. Organization? Community Alliance with Family Farmers. All right, thank you. Yes, so hi, doing, yes. Hi, yeah. <laughs> uh, doing tracking around the country. Yeah. Is there any vision for potentially ever being able to scale in the way that others would be able to plug into that actual system and use it themselves? Oh, yes. <laughs> We're developing a technology. I mean, there's so much. This is what I mean about using 21st century technology, you know, like, like solar power, uh, which is old technology in some ways, but 21st century technology. Uh, yeah, we're talking with tech partners and figuring out a way to ha have this be a useful tool in general. So there's a lot to come along those lines. It's exciting. So uh, thank you for that. Yeah. And I'm going to introduce my colleague, uh, Gloria Partida, who's going to introduce the panelists. I do have a favor for uh, Gloria. Uh, Matt uh, is sort of first in line for the next round of questions. Uh, should his question, uh, uh, sh should he still have the a question for the panel or the, the speaker. Uh, we're sorry we didn't get to your question, Matt, but first in line for the next round. And uh, as uh, Gloria is uh, pulling up some information, I'd just like to say again, uh, thank you, Paula, for speaking. It's, uh, it's not only interesting, but it's also very exciting. I believe that uh, if uh, we were to fast forward a year from now, I, I would be very surprised if our community and area did not incorporate some of the ideas that she's talked about. I'd be very surprised. And uh, Paul, you're sitting next to uh, County Supervisor Don Saylor, who I think uh, is also very interested in this area. Okay. So do you want to go ahead and just uh, introduce the panelists and have them? Uh Let me show my slides really quick. Um, well, I'm going to introduce the panelists so that they can take their seats while my slides are being pulled up. And I've only got five minutes, I was told, so it, I won't take very long. Um, we have Dr. Catherine Brinkley from UC Davis. Thank you. And Robin Waxman has a, a local farm in Davis. And Anya McCain from Cool Cuisine. Evan Dumas, there you are, okay. Um, and he's with UCD Food Recovery Network. Don Saylor, who's our uh, county supervisor. And Andrea Leopor of the Food Factory in Hot Italian and Solomon's. So um, I just wanted to also welcome everyone and thank you for coming. And I wanted to take this opportunity as we're talking about food sustainability to put in a plug for equity because I believe in uh, making sure that when we have any important conversation that we remember equity. And hopefully I will be able to do this correctly. So food sustainability is, um, you've had a very good presentation on, is the production of food uh, that protects the environment, public health, human communities, and animal welfare. Yay, I did that right. Okay, and so I think that this is a great graphic um, that sort of shows all the areas that people normally think about when they think about food sustainability. And what I think often is left out is in the upper right-hand corner, and that's fair and accessible. And there are a lot of ways that you can uh, bring equity when you're, when you're working on food sustainability. There was um, a grant that was set up by the Kellogg Foundation. And they went into communities and uh, had people compete for these grants where um, uh, they uh, you know, brought forward very creative ways to engage different communities and uh, culturally engage those communities. And so this is an example of uh, two grants that were, that were given. Uh, one was in New Orleans, where uh, this group put together a whole uh, program around the culture in, in New Orleans and the food there. 
And one of the reasons that I find this interesting is because the other focus that I have is economic development. And it, part of the, the conversations that we've been having is you know, ways that we can use food sustainability and our, and our relationship with UC Davis to provide um, you know, a, a transfer of the technology there to create jobs in Davis. And whenever we have those conversations, uh, what I have, what comes to my mind is how are we going to um, make that an opportunity for everyone in the community? So this is um, one of my favorite ways that uh, LA took um, food and created opportunity. Homeboy Industries in LA, where I am from, uh, was started by Father Greg, yes, Greg Boyle, and um, so took uh, pr gave this opportunity uh, to people who had, you know, been in trouble, and um, set up a, a kitchen, and and I, I I believe that you know people gravitate towards uh, these types of uh, endeavors because it makes them feel good. It feel, you feel good when you're supporting people and you're giving them the opportunity. And, and it just creates all sorts of um, wonderful opportunities. And, and I think that food is a, is a wonderful way to sort of, to, um, you know, it's, it's a common, ground that people can rally around. And in my opinion, you know, Paul Newman has nothing on homeboy industries. Uh, this is a more local effort. I don't know, there are people here who know Stella Rees. Uh, she uh, created this group in Oak Park at the elementary schools, and she taught fourth graders how to run a food business. And so they spent, you know, some time putting together a business plan, and then they served um, a very fancy meal. This is one of my favorite um, uh, businesses in town. Uh, this is uh, Puro's Churros, if anyone has ever had. They are probably the best churros in Davis. <laughs> um, and this is my son. And this is his business partner, and that's my grandson in the middle. And um, I started this food, it's a food booth, and we go to festivals. My son has cerebral palsy, and so uh, he has a very difficult time finding employment, and so uh, he's very proud of running this business, and both he and his um, partner, Lori, are in wheelchairs. And um, they have a great time, and we make great churros. This is another one of my favorites. This is Purple Tree Cafe. And uh, do you want to stand up? <laughs> this is Pam's business, and she started this. It's a bicycle coffee cart, which fits very nicely into our value system here, and uh, she employs uh, people with disabilities. And she makes wonderful uh, vegan um, baked goods. They And uh, farmer's market Wednesday night. Okay, so this slide is a very familiar slide to some of us. This is our budget over a number of years in Davis. And what I want to point out uh, here is that uh, you see the dips, and the dips are um, recessions. So recessions come along. Uh, right now, we are in the longest upswing. I think we're 10 years on, a, on an upswing, which means that people are very nervously looking at the next recession. And I think that um, it's really important that we build resilience around our economy. And it's, I think that, you know, having a really strong um, system around food is, is important. And I think that it's, um, it's, it's a great opportunity for us to, um, to be supportive in this, in this area and to sort of 
uh, have a, a, a guard for when that recession hits. And that's all I've got. I told you I was going to be brief. Is this still on? Yes. So I think that what we're going to do is that each panelist will uh, have five minutes, and then we'll take questions after. All right. Uh, I'll start, um, and I'll give you the, the, the gift of brevity. I'll speak less than five minutes. Um, really, um, thank you to Judy for, for, for helping to organize. Thank you to, to Paula for coming and, and talking to us about food policy councils. Thank you to all of... Um, our elected officials, uh, the, our business owners, the nonprofits, the students who are in the room who are excited about this topic because it's something that's been bubbling up. And Dima Tamimi, who really helped organize this but couldn't be here today, um, this was this she she put this on, and she and I, along with Judy, serve on the Downtown Planning Advisory Committee. And food is constantly coming to the surface uh, as something that the community cares about and wants to do something about. So this um, talk tonight is part of a, a series. We've, we've had um, three discussions about what are the strengths that Davis has, what are some opportunities, and where might we go? And this is a wonderful um, launch pad for thinking about what might happen. And as our mayor has said, it's probably going to happen next year, which is exciting. So there's some momentum. So from those three um, conversations that happened prior to tonight, I just want to share some of the strengths and the opportunities that the community identified. Um, as you all know, our neighbor is the University of California Davis, which is the number one agriculture university um, in the country, number two in the world, sometimes number one. We have um, 400 faculty who uh, focus on food. Um, we're in Yolo County, which is one of the most agriculturally biodiverse regions in the world. Um, and Davis, as a city, has a food legacy in its own right with a co-op, um, one of the nation's oldest farmers markets, and the farm to school uh, program. So we have, we have strengths to build on here. We also have opportunities. So we don't have a polystyrene ban on uh, takeout. A lot of cities in California already have that. Um, we don't allow food trucks unless they move um, every 10 minutes. And because of the good work of the LA Food Policy Council and the Street Food Vendor um, um, Alliance in LA, a new state poli policy that has come down this year uh, means that Davis will need to rethink its public health policies around street food vending. We also don't have a billboard like Winters has that you know has that beautiful cornucopia of food spilling out into the city. So we don't really have a, an identity around our food despite having so many strengths. Um, and we are the city in Yolo County with the highest percentage of the food insecure population. So we, we have to think about um, building on our legacy of sustainability, um, thinking about economic development, our economic development plan was from the 1990s, so it's time, um, and also how to build in that, that fair um, and equitable piece that, that Mayor Pro Tem Gloria Partita talked about. So there's some really exciting um, conversations, and I, I wanted to leave you all with that so you can start thinking about what Paula has shared with us tonight and what we might do um, here that will be unique because Davis is not LA, even though I can see um, us biking down a dirt road in, in ag. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Andrea Lepore. This is on, can you hear me? Um, I'm Andrea Lepore, and I am uh, have a few hats here, but um, I founded Hot Italian in 2009, um, if you're familiar with Hot Italian. We were the first uh, LEED certified restaurant in the region, um, the first bicycle friendly restaurant in California, and then became the first real certified uh, rest or pizzeria rather in uh, the United States. Um, didn't fare as well in Davis. Um, <laughs> so I turned that into Solomon's Delicatessen, which I'm also a founder of. Uh, Solomon's is um, inspired by sort of the New York uh, delicatessens, but with more of a California twist. So um, 
he recently became also the first Jewish delicatessen that's real certified in, uh, in the US. Uh, we're over in the Davis Commons and we're opening in downtown Sacramento, which is uh, in a Tower Records um, store, which is hence the name Solomon's Delicatessen, named after Russ Solomon. If you're f familiar with Tower Records, which was closed back in 2006, unfortunately, but Russ was from Sacramento and, and there was nothing in Sacramento that signified that Tower was ever from from the regions, we wanted to honor Russ and, and, and the history and, and um, what Tower meant to so many people as a community gathering place. Um, but one of the reasons I'm, I was invited here tonight was to talk about the Food Factory. And the Food Factory is a development I've been working on for about three years. Um, I started it, um, like I said, about three years ago when I was finishing my master's in sustainable design. And it's a uh, food incubator for small food producers. Um, the site is about 35,000 square feet. It's located on a two and a half acre site in Sacramento. Um, we really look at it as not just a Sacramento um, uh, sort of benefit, but rather a regional one. Uh, there's about 200 incubators around the country and none in, in this region. Um, so it's really intended for small food producers, uh, hopefully you know, healthy and, and uh, functional foods. Um, con consumer packaged goods, whatnot. Um, yeah, I'm a graduate of UC Davis, and there's about, I think, 7,000 students that graduate every year in, in food and ag departments here, and they kind of go off to other, other parts of, of the, the state or country because there's not places here for them to start businesses. So hopefully uh, we can get this incubator off the ground and, and really be a, an opportunity for, for people to, to start their business and, 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 and grow it. Uh, one of the benefits, I think, aside from being you know, the farm to fork capital, um, the connection with UC Davis, and then obviously the connection with uh, the capital and, and really having an impact and, and influence on food policy. So I'll be around for questions. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> um, I, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Robin Waxman. I'm the executive director of a nonprofit organization in town called Farm Davis. And um, Farm Davis asks the next generation to examine their role in a current system that perpetuates economic inequality and food insecurity in a way that they can undermine. So we're asking people to undermine that system in a way, though, that encourages generosity. So we exist 100% through the generosity of our community. Um, we don't sell any food. Basically, we grow food to give away in shorter terms. So um, we started in 2009. It took me about a month, but I convinced my husband to donate our front yard to the public over on K Street. And that year, we grew 1,000 pounds of food on our front yard um, with the help of UC Davis students. Before this time, there was not a plant that had survived my touch. I don't know why I did this. But um, we, since then, two years later, we thought, what could be better than an urban farm but a real farm? So we went ahead and purchased a 2.6-acre parcel on Road 95. It's about a 45-minute bike ride from here. And we invited the public to farm with us. Um, since then, I was certified as a master gardener, and I actually now know how to grow a plant. But we, um, last year, we grew 6,400 pounds of food um, between the K Street Farm, we have a, a small front yard that we're farming in South Davis and Farm 2.6, which is our 2.6 acre farm. Um, we feed over 9,000 people in Davis every year. Um, our food only goes to low income and homeless people. So we work directly with Davis Community Meals, Steak, um, Empower Yolo, a women's shelter that they have, and two low income housing uh, residencies in Davis to supply their fruit and vegetables. They get plenty of, of bread donation, but they don't get a whole lot of fresh fruit and vegetables. So um, we've been growing a whole bunch of food. We're asking everyone to come and learn. People come and we start from the beginning. Most, most people who come don't know how to do anything. And so we have a lesson and uh, we meet every other Saturday. We also meet during the week. We meet on uh, Monday, Tuesdays, and Thursdays, which are our donation days. 
and uh, we ask you if you would like to come and learn how to garden and farm uh, with a group that has maybe like-minded ideals we would invite you to come and help us out. Um, if every one of you had come to a farm work day, we could probably get everything done. <laughs> All of you. So uh, we also, because we run on the generosity of the public, um, we have small grants and things like that that we get, the Seroptimus and Rotary Club bought us a tractor, and so we're actually like a real farming operation, we just don't sell anything. And um, we would also invite you at the end of the year to open up your pocketbook and um, donate some money to Farm Davis if you'd like to see us keep doing our work. Otherwise, if there's no seeds, we don't plant anything. We just 100% rely on the generosity and the culture of, of Davis. Thank you. If you've never been to a work day at Farm Davis, it's really fun, I encourage you. Um, my name is Anya McCann, I'm the founder of Cool Cuisine. I'm gonna spin this conversation just a little bit to, to, to a different side. Um, we have about 400 uh, members on Meetup and another 400, 500 on social media and access to about 3,000 uh, plant-based eaters in the area. Um, I'm just wondering how many of you in this room have been to a Cool Cuisine event? And um, how many of you have been to a Plant Punk Kitchen dinner? Okay. Um, of 5%, oh, only 5% of the corn in the United States is grown for human consumption. 95% goes to feed animals that people eat. Uh, a very recent large study uh, published in the journal Science reviewed data from 40,000 farms in 119 countries covering 40 food products that represent 90% of all that is eaten. Alarmingly, livestock provide 18% of calories and only 37% of protein, but they take up 83% of the farmland. That's a really bad efficiency loss. Um, avoiding meat and dairy products is the single big, biggest way that you can reduce your environmental impact on the planet. Um, the author of this study uh, from Oxford University said a vegan diet is probably the single biggest way to reduce your impact on planet Earth, not just greenhouse gases, but global acidification, eutrophication, land use, water use. It is far bigger than cutting down on your flights or buying an electric car. Um, if you've read the recent article that my husband and I circulated last month, um, we really think that sustainable food could be a theme uh, and an identity for Davis and the future, and we've been really going to all the downtown planning meetings, and we're really excited about it. Um, and I could take this discussion in a billion different directions, but I'm going to focus really narrowly today on cool cuisine and, um, and food in restaurants and at public gatherings. Um, and I think that we can weave these themes of low carbon food throughout all of the ideas that are being circulated today. I think there's, like a, there's a place for it to be part of all of these discussions. Um, if you wanna reduce your impact on the planet, the World Resources Institute says you should, one, eat less calories, two, eat less animal products, and three, specifically eat less beef. I know that most people in this room are not gonna switch to a fully plant-based diet, but my goal and the goal of Cool Cuisine is to make it easier for you to eat less animal products and lower, lower on the food chain. Um, we work to make sure that there's options in our local restaurants so that everyone has a larger selection of delicious, planet-friendly and plant-based foods. The more great options there are, they displace meat on the menus and just overall we do better on our, on our uh, environmental goals. Um, the, uh, if everyone in Davis dropped meat off of your menu for just a few more meals a week, it could make a difference as a community and it will help us reach our community um, climate action goals. Um, so I know that statistics aren't really gonna, gonna convince you, but maybe mouthwatering delicious food might. Uh, at the Sunrise Rotary's Oktoberfest, this year, 80 out of the 630 guests chose the delicious new plant-based sausage that we offered, and another 10 or 20 others really wanted it, but we ran out. That tells me that about 15% of attendees at your average Davis event 
would prefer or go for a plant-based option. Um, so I'm encouraging everybody to, to start thinking about that in your event planning. Um, we're running a large um, a burger battle coming this March. Uh, professional chefs at our local restaurants are going to compete to create the most mouth-watering, delicious burger that happens to be planet-friendly and completely plant-based. Uh, we expect 20 restaurants to participate, and diners will vote at, for awards that were, are going to be given in several categories. They did this in Sacramento in June. Uh, 30 restaurants designed 50 different burgers, and over 16,500 burgers were sold in one month. So it was a really good uh, economic uh, little shot in the arm in Sacramento, and the restaurants were really thrilled, and they all, about more than half of them added uh, the, the item to their menu. Uh, to make it more fun, we're encouraging people to join up with your family, your friends, your colleagues, and your clubs to form tasting teams and create your own awards. So you can grow, go and grab a beer and a burger and then vote. Uh, service clubs, church groups, fraternities, and sororities, uh, the city council. I hope everybody's going to participate. Um, I've got flyers in the back that give you our, our uh, website and some information. Um, and uh, we also have a new card that if you happen to like eating plant-based, you can take a few of them. And it's a thank you card to restaurants saying thanks for doing a good job. You can drop it off uh, you know, when, you, yep, when you pay your bill. Um, Anyway, uh, as, a, as a part of the bigger picture, I suggest that the city of Davis and people who live here aim to get to the point soon where every organization and institution in town can claim to always have a decent, attractive, and delicious plant-based food option at their events and aim to reduce the amount of animal products at events. Um, I've suggested through the Natural Resources Council uh, Commission that uh, all city-sponsored events could be plant-based or at least have a good option, and city vending machines could have 50% plant, planet-friendly options in them, DJ USD cafeterias, every church luncheon, every Rotary Club breakfast and dinner, and all of our wonderful annual fundraising meals like Village Feast and Oktoberfest. So I encourage every person in this room to think about how you can contribute to that mission through making suggestions to the groups you're involved with. Uh, we also have, you can use, take our thank you cards, you can take my card, and um, you know, please feel free to contact me if you need some advice uh, on how to implement any of that. And you can sign up to get information about the burger battle in the back as well. Thanks. Hi. Um, I'm going to just run a timer so I stay on time. Um, hi, my name's Evan. I'm a student at UC Davis um, and also the current president of the Food Recovery Network. Um, for those of you who haven't heard of Food Recovery Network, we're a chapter of a national organization on about 230 college campuses. Um, and what we do is essentially pick up, so we go, we're at the very end of the whole food system as it is at the moment. Um, we're at the point where the food is good but would have been put in the landfill. Um, so wasted food essentially that's totally edible. And we pick it up and take it to homeless shelters in Davis, Woodland, and Sacramento. Um, so the way that we work and operate um, is we're entirely student run. Um, we receive support from faculty um, and from the university to varying degrees and from different departments, but for the most part, we're run entirely by students. Um, we pick up from the dining commons on campus, from the markets on campus, um, and now recently, thanks to a partnership with Yellow Food Bank, we also pick up from the farmer's market at Davis. So um, the Friday farmer's market, not the Friday, the Saturday one, we go up to the vendors at the end of the day and ask them any produce, ask if they have any produce they weren't able to sell, we collect it and donate it on campus, actually. Um, so I guess the way that this relates to Paula's um, talk and what the LA Food Policy Council is doing is we wouldn't be able to do what we are doing without connection and networking. Um, the Food Recovery Network at Davis was founded in 2013, and from 2013 to 2017, which is when the current officer board took over, we had only recovered about 12,000-ish pounds of food. Um, from 2017 to 2018, we recovered 19,000 pounds of food. From September to now, we've recovered 17,000 pounds of food. 
Um, so if you're familiar with exponential growth, that's what that looks like. Um, and none of that would have happened without us making connections. The way the club operated from 2011, not 11, 13 to 2015, um, 2017, getting all the dates mixed up. Um, the way we operate it is we ask for student volunteers to ride bikes with bike trailers from the DCs to the shelters in Davis. Um, the average person could only carry about max 100 pounds of food on a trailer on a bike on a rainy day in Davis at like 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and so our capacity was a lot lower and we had no idea that people were interested in what we were doing. Um, sometimes we'd sit there and be like, why are there more people not helping and volunteering with us? We are such a great cause. Um, and it doesn't matter how great your cause is if you don't tell people about it. Um, like, to be honest, that's what it was. The second thing is we were originally running a platform where we had one intern riding their bike, hauling the food. Um, and again, no matter how great your cause is, if it's not fun, people are going to stop doing it. Um, so in coordination with telling people about what we do, actually asking for help instead of being full of our hubris that we could do it on our own. Um, we have now been able to expand. We have our own electric vehicle. Um, we borrow a van from campus without having to pay for it. Um, we actually now donate some of the food we collect from campus to campus. Um, so it's a pretty crazy exponential growth that doesn't come from great leadership. Um, it comes from just talking with people. Um, and the Food Policy Council is a perfect example of that. It is bringing people together from all different stakeholder viewpoints um, and organizational viewpoints who had no idea each other existed and trying to come up with a better solution. And to be honest, uh, every conversation I've had hasn't always led to some sort of actionable result. Um, but just having that conversation or hearing another person's conversation has led to all of our best ideas. Um, so yeah, connection. That's the theme. Thank you. So I'm Don Saylor. I'm a county supervisor representing Davis Winters, the campus area and the farm country in the southwestern part of Yolo County. Uh, thanks. Thanks to Dima and Catherine and Ann for the work that you've been doing on food, on food connection issues. And thanks to the Davis Futures Forum and the City of Davis for hosting this event and to Davis Media Access for, for uh, filming it and being, I'm sure, going to be broadcasting in the community in, in a little, little while here. I, some themes that I heard in Paula's talk, one is the power of shared leadership, and, and uh, Evan just, just talked about that, that shared leadership, connection, and collaboration. There are a lot of food heroes in this room and a lot of food heroes in Davis and Yolo County, but if we don't find better ways of connecting and, and we're missing opportunities to, to really make a, a powerful difference. I want to recognize the YOLO Food Bank that's here. You know, the Food Bank is two representatives, uh, Joy Cohen and Michael Bish are in the room with us. We used to think of food banks as the place of last resort for food, and, and unfortunately they've become more and more relied upon for the first resort for much of our population around the country. Here in Yolo County, one in six people is food insecure, one in six adults is food insecure, and one in four children are, are food insecure. Catherine mentioned that Davis has one of the highest food insecurity rates in the county. Davis has the highest poverty rate in the county. You don't think of it that way because we often think of starving students and we sort of chuckle that that's a, a fun status. But the truth of the matter is in at UC Davis and other campuses around California, starving students is no joking matter. We do have students who are not going to, they're not coming from places where BMWs graze. They're coming from places where their whole community raised the money to send them off. And we've got food insecure students here in large numbers. A few years ago, when I first joined the Board of Supervisors, uh, I, would, I began to become more and more aware of the hunger issues that face us in Yolo County. And Catherine again said something very powerful about the strengths that we have. Mediterranean climate, uh, strong technology, really, really successful growers, the world's leading university, I don't care what those rankings say, uh, in, in agricultural research. Wherever you go in the world, you're going to hear about UC Davis if you connect with anybody in agriculture. We're, we're packed with food heroes, from Gail Feenstra, who uh, kind of wrote the book on food systems, to the people at, on this, on this, at this table, and several others that I, that I recognize from the work that, that we've done. 
Uh, we've got we've got everything we need, and yet there are still hungry people here. And so we've got to lash it up. When we talk about farm to fork in our Sacramento region, uh, we've re got to realize that it needs to be farm to every fork. Two percent of the food that we produce uh, is eaten here in our in our region, in our six county region. Because I think region, you know, Paula, you mentioned region as the unit of action. I tend to agree with you. In our six county region, the Sacramento area, uh, only 2% of the food that we produce is eaten here. The rest is sent someplace else. A lot of it is sent away to be canned and processed and sent back to us and we buy it at the discount stores and the big boxes. And we don't know that it was actually produced just a few miles away. So we've, we've got a food system that is geared largely toward export, for, toward an agricultural economy that is global, that does produce the Pop-Tarts in Paris, but we also have, but that's not, and that's okay, that's a good, that's a reasonable part of our, of our economy, but we have a more diverse food system that needs our support, from producers to transporters to processors to manufacturers, to the, the various round ways of getting food in the hands of consumers, from institutional consumers to the traditional markets, to the farmers markets, uh, and, and to the food support programs that many of the people here are trying to find ways to patch. So I, th I think the, the power of shared leadership resonated with me. The description that Paula gave about the rate and scope of change as we think about where we're going next. Some of us are talking to people in the agricultural uh, sector who are starting to think about all kinds of new ways of producing more and better healthy food. Uh, there's the technology of today is not the same technology in the, in the fields a uh, hundred years ago. And we, count, and we know that it's not gonna be the same in the time ahead. So we are in a situation with the strengths that we have to really prepare for those next waves of change and to be sure that as we move forward, it's not just an agricultural economy designed to make money for people and to process chemicals into stuff that we call food, but it actually is a, is a place where, where the food system works for everybody. Our region is a, a region that's poised to, to be the best, and we already are in terms of most of these issues, but we, we can and must do a, a whole lot better. Uh, I think that um, we, we have so many food heroes, and the key for us is to, is to move together to, to strengthen our balanced food system so that when we're talking about farm to fork, we're talking about farm to every fork. A few years ago, uh, we started, Diane Perro and I convened a group of people we called YOLO Food Connect. And the idea was to bring this kind of a conversation together. It is more of a, we, we just set it up as sort of the, um, the intentional forum for accidental collaboration. So we come together, we share each other's ideas, and the, the key success in those meetings that we have about every quarter for me is that nobody wants to leave. When the meeting is over, people continue to find things that they want to work on together. And one of those is the, is, uh, is the, the business with, the, with, with Solano Park and the food recovery network that, that uh, Ethan is talking about, Evan is talking about, and, and the food bank collaboration that works there. One last comment for, for me. I do want to continue to dwell on, I, I, want to, I, I, want to, I want to tell you a little bit more about why we have the high food, security, food insecurity and poverty rate in Davis. It's because the campus has 30, more than 30,000 people out of a total of about 65,000, give or take. Those numbers are, are generally on the target. And those folks, the, the student population counts <laughs> they count in these numbers and they count in the real world experience of human beings. And so we've been working hard to find ways to provide connection and access to the food support programs, CalFresh or SNAP or food stamps, however you want to call it, WIC the, and, the, uh, and, and, the, and free and reduced lunch program, meal programs for students. Having those programs be more and more accessible, easy to get to, and easy to understand for students on campus. And this campus is the first one in California that actually has county eligibility workers on campus working with students to help them go through the application processes. That now is embedded in what's called this, the, the uh, 
uh, Aggie Compass, which is now no longer in the back rooms in a, in a carol or someplace hidden that students can't ever go to on purpose. And now, it, now it's in the Memorial Union right up front in the front yard, sort of the entrance point. So people, students can come in, there's food available that's donated by local farmers, and they have a way to get into a, a program where they can access greater, greater amounts of food. These things happen when the thing that, that uh, Evan talked about, when we connect and when we collaborate and when we find ways to do something that we couldn't have even thought of if we, did, if we were doing it all by ourselves. So I, I really, I think you're a genius in those, in those comments. And, that, uh, and Paula, thanks again for coming. I was going to ask this question of Paula, but it, it, it's even more topical given what we've just heard from the from the panel. Um, your first name is Andrea. Um, the experience Andrea had with hot Italian, and I, I ate there probably a half a dozen times in its enough, short really. history, but it exactly, it <laughs> wasn't enough. And part of what was said in other discussions, Anya, in putting together her network of cool cuisine, the, the network of the students in, in putting forward, for all the things that Paula talked about, we have many of them very advanced. Our food production and all is really very strong. We have a lot of awareness and focus on social justice issues, could be more, but the lifeblood, getting to your economic development point, is that we have more people who are going to rest good restaurants like Andrea's. And the networking that has succeeded with these other areas is something that I think we need to do much more of as a community. And I'd like to get some of the ideas of the people in the panel about how we can network together so that the 80% who are the silent majority, we all are in the 10% in the or 20% who really care and who are really involved, but her business succeeds because the 80% come and they're aware of just how good a restaurant hers is. Um, my favorite restaurant in town is Yakitori Yushan, and I bet you there are many people in this room who've never heard of Yakitori Yushan. Um, it meets all of the criteria that are here. What could we do as a community to network better and to make sure that businesses like Andrea's that epitomize our goals don't end up in Sacramento? Well, I, I promise I didn't uh, pay him to come tonight. Uh, <laughs> No, I think it's a good question. I think it's it's actually a question I've been asking myself, um, and I obviously believe in 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 Davis enough to open another restaurant here um, because I do believe that you know the people that that live here, not just students, um, you know, will sort of um, speak with their wallet. Um, I think it's. It's difficult in Davis where, um, you know, our, a lot of people are house poor. You know, the housing here is very expensive, and there's a lot of young families. I think there's, what, nine elementary schools here, which says that there's a lot of young families here. Um, and so, you know, as young families, your your priority, obviously, is, is your kids, and, and so your kids are doing violin and water polo and, and have a lot of demands and so really the last priority is going out to restaurants um, and so I think it's um, you know our responsibility to keep reminding people that we do have you know good food and healthy food and even though it is in a restaurant um, it's you know we make everything from scratch and, and we do source you know sustainable seafood and, and, and do all those things that that people want um but it's i don't know i mean i don't not sure i have the <laughs> exact answer um obviously because um you know solomon's has only been open now six months and 
And we're hanging in there, and I think you know, Davis Commons really primarily is a lunch place, um, which Solomon's primarily is as well. It's kind of breakfast and lunch, so it fits better there than Hot Italian did. So hopefully, knock on wood, it'll, it'll do better. So, if anyone else has anything to add to that? We just created a network. You saw my slide on working groups, so we just created one for entrepreneurs uh, to see, you know, what what some of the issues are. But we were mostly looking at developing businesses along the supply chain because we want to rework the supply chain to a value-based supply chain. If you know know what I mean by that, meaning reflecting the values. Supporting restaurants is something that we do have chefs as part of our food policy council. Um, so that's. I think it's important to bring folks together and figure out what the common needs are. It's a policy council, so what's the policy changes that need to be made? It's usually what our question is when we come together. Anybody else want to add to that? Yes. I, I do, actually. Okay. Yeah, so um, this is just an example of maybe what you're talking about, but a couple of weeks ago, we had a fundraiser at Dunlow Brewery. Have any of you guys been to Dunlow Brewery? It's really neat. I had never been there, and what happened was because we made this partnership, all of our farm people went to someplace they had never been before and were introduced to a brewery that's pretty awesome. They had beer that tastes like whiskey. It's really neat. So um, they, they had discovered this place. So I think that you were talking about the people who care, like the 10% of the people who care. If, if those people can be matched up, you know, in, in that way, like if, if businesses were willing to host these things, like restaurants were willing to host these things, I think it's, it was an excellent way in which people had been introduced to that brewery. I just want to say, when you're talking about matching up, Robin, um, I'm wondering if there's a way that uh, some of the p homeless people who um, don't have a myriad of other problems, but who just are jobless and um, could be gotten out to where you need the help, because I think that it's a great opportunity for them to get the training, now that you're a master gardener, um, and actually how to grow things, and then we can get them involved in growing food for themselves and others, and we we'll get you the help that you need. So there's just a thought there. Hi, I'm struck that only two of the panelists up here are embedded in the market system. Everyone else is working outside of the, the exchange system, You're working on providing services versus kind of a, a business model where, there's, where it's market-based sort of things. And I also, I, but I'm, so I'm, I'm struck that how, that the market is failing to feed our people. We have a failure of the, of the capitalist system, failure of ex the exchange system to basically feed the people who really need it in their system. I'm also struck that basically these food councils are a way of working around. The old way of change in our American economy was uh, in, in entrepreneurs, but this innovation, this new kind of this lead standard for the food system is a way of basically spurring these food councils, a way of spurring things. I'm wondering whether how we can, what that says about 20th century capitalism, and I'm, just, I'm kind of ruining it, but Paul has some comments about whether the capitalist system can change enough to really feed our people in the, in the country. Does anybody want to take that? Do you want to take that, Paul? All right, I'm thinking it's a question about capitalism. So uh, I just think it's about making the economy work for us. And I do think that, I guess if you want to go back to original ideas, you have Jefferson and Hamilton. <laughs> but this will be short, don't worry. <laughs> and I'm not going to break out into song. But <laughs> Hamilton had a view of a centralized manufacturing global economy, basically, although he didn't imagine America being what it is now. Jefferson was more for the smallholder farm than believe in an agrarian economy. So I think it's a matter of kind of decentralizing our economy again, because uh, it's quite consolidated. Um, it's, it's, I'm not against capitalism. I actually believe in business and enterprise. Uh, I just think 
there needs to be more in the middle stream. So we have a lot of small, which is great. We need more in the middle, and I'm, I'm about the middle. And so we're trying to build a mid-scale economy through our purchasing program for regions. It's that large, consolidated, in the, in the hands of a few, oligarchic economy that I don't think works well for us. So building out that mid-scale is a goal for, for me, at least. I'd like to make just a, a couple comments on that, too. Part of this is not about uh, eliminating the, the ability for people to create businesses and make, and make, a, make a, a profit to care for, them, their, for their families and to care for their futures. It's some of it is about removing some of the barriers to entry for in the marketplace. So one of the challenges that farmers have is, is always being able to have access to markets. So if you're a large farmer, you've got contracts and you've got all kinds of ways to guarantee that your product is going to be sold at either risks involved, but you've got a heavy risks, but you've got a, a structure, an infrastructure in the economy to support your activities. If you're small, you're probably, you're, you're going to have some challenges. Be, but you're going to create things like farmers markets and CSA deliveries and, and all kinds of other alternative approaches to the traditional market system. Part of what I think local food systems can focus on is reducing barriers to entry for, for new kinds of businesses that are innovative, that are, that are coming up. Places like, well, I'm going to say, like, like uh, the upper crust that is looking at ways of partnering with other businesses to create new kinds of products and have new, new, new ways of accessing your markets. And those kinds of businesses exist uh, throughout our, our community. And, and we're, we're talking about making them more, uh, more available. I will tell you, though, that in addition to the, the economic aspect of this, when we talk about food security and hunger that we've talked about a little bit here, uh, we're t it's a proxy for poverty. And if we talk about uh, we're going to solve the issues of poverty in our county or our city or our region, people's eyes glaze over because they don't really want to talk about it. It probably offends them in some ways, or they want the people who are poor to simply pull themselves up by their own bootstraps as if they have those to start with. But if we talk about hungry children, people pay attention and they think that they own a part of the of the, the problem and they're interested in helping address it. That's the genius of it to me. Hi, um, I guess I'd just like to, to uh, talk about carbon for a minute. So um, in Paula's presentation, she had that wonderful IPCC um, data-derived graph that shows agriculture is 24% of emissions. When you start talking about it from a livestock livestock perspective, it comes into about 18% of all emissions are affiliated with livestock specifically. Um, and so we've talked a lot about equity in terms of access to food, but we haven't talked a lot about equity in terms of carbon balance affiliated with food. So when are we going to really start pushing forward forward and adopting policies that correctly price emissions uh, for food. So you can look at a fee bait like we've instituted for other things where you take high carbon foods to subsidize lower carbon foods and people that are buying higher carbon foods tend to be more affluent and those buying lower carbon foods tend to be less affluent. You can really start getting to a lot of uh, uh, social and economic equity issues if you start dealing with the carbon equity in our food budgets and food balances. Um, and I don't see anyone really presenting a lot of solutions here to start dealing with this uh, direct issue that we need to address. Uh, if you look at California right now, at a state level, we price carbon emissions from literally every sector except for agriculture. Um, and that seems like a huge issue. And if we start talking regionally, maybe we should be pricing carbon in agricultural products regionally so we can start dealing with our local issues. Um, I don't see any good reason other than AB 1838, which was enacted, which directly prevents us from taxing agricultural products in grocery stores. But there's no reason we can't start thinking about this from a different perspective and actually using some of our policies and some of our goodwill and some of our networks to create incentives to level the playing field for new business practices to come in that actually offer lower carbon food options and rewarding them by making it more expensive for their traditional conventional food systems to play in our market. So I'd appreciate people's comments or thoughts on what they're doing to try and address this 24% of the emission issue. Well, I'll, I'll just say that you know, it's sort of dovetailing on what Don said, um, I mean, I think we need to be able to provide access for not, you know, farmers and, and makers so they do have the ability um, to make products locally 
and then distribute locally. I mean, right now, even if even at Nugget and, and Co-op, I mean, how many of the products that are actually made here? Um, it's really hard to buy only products other than produce that's actually made here. And if it's not easy for these makers to make their products uh, because they don't have access to capital or commercial kitchen or you know whatever the barriers are, um, we have to make it easy and affordable for for these um, makers to be able to produce their product locally and then distribute locally. So um, it's, uh, oh, it's not an easy thing to answer quickly. It's an important question. Uh, taxes are complicated. You raise tax as a way to do it. They can be regressive in nature, though, um, depending on how you manage it. Um, there is some, I wouldn't say it's happening here in California, but I have read about some uh, question about um, a carbon tax on factory farm meat production. Um, it's been raised in other countries um, and other parts of the world. There's an effort called True Cost Accounting in Food underway that's uh, trying to calculate the negative externalities of food. Um, you could look at TEAB Ag. You know, so a lot of these efforts are happening internationally to quantify these externalities, which can in turn, once they're more known, lead to uh, you know, remedial types of uh, ways to address it. It depends on how that provokes the public policy response and what the public will is toward that. Um, I will say in our program, we do have uh, a way to address environmental sustainability through meat reduction. So uh, this is what Cool Davis was talking about. So Oakland Unified actually was able to reduce their carbon footprint, reduce their water footprint, and save $42,000 by reducing meat in their food. So there's kind of a behavioral shift that can happen. There's lots of levels at which these shifts can take place, as was mentioned, a behavioral shift is one that can start impacting it. But if you really want to look at it from that point of quantifying and addressing, um, I would say TBAG and the True Cost Accounting and Food efforts, which are happening globally, are moving in that direction. The policy response is complicated, given the current national and international political situation. So unfortunate, did you want to? I just want to say, if I think that um, if we want to address that on a really local level, one of the things that we are, if we're gonna, going to meet our, our climate action goals as a city is uh, that this theme for our new downtown, if we're gonna create, uh, we're gonna create, say, on G Street, uh, a kind of an innovation center, I don't know, we're, we're using different names for it, but if there's gonna be some kind of a space created where it's got a theme attached to it, that um, coming up with something that's focused on lower carbon foods and, f and sustainable foods um, is a really great direction, I think, for our city to go. Thank you. Unfortunately, we are out of time. If, I think you can ask um, people questions directly, and we want to give an opportunity to, um, do you want to do your thing? Okay. Um, put a, a plug in for future future forums. So um, most of you, um, I'm Chris Granger with Cool Davis. Uh, cool Davis uh, provides the platform upon which uh, uh, Davis Future Forum is a working group of Cool Davis, as is um, Cool Cuisine. And um, what I would like to encourage you to think about is um, how you can get involved. Um, there, I'm guessing there's gonna be some um, activities that come out of this discussion, um, but uh, also Cool Cuisine and uh, the Davis Futures Forum are always looking for volunteers um, and other people who wanna get involved in their work. Um, this next year, we'll be looking at some new topics for Davis Futures Forum, and uh, Judy Corbett, who's here tonight, has been the lead for um, thinking those up and bringing great speakers like Paula to us um, from other places, so uh, we'll be putting out a survey um, at the end of this month, and um, when you, if you get that electronically, we'd love to get input from you about uh, future uh, topics that you'd like to hear about. Um, so thank you for coming tonight. Also, we've got an envelope with other people's money, but please keep it hidden. So if you just put a little money in the envelope, and we give back our bills with like a grant. I'd like to...
This is on, yes. I'd like to just uh, thank Paula again and Judy and our panel. And um, it, if people would like to uh, ask a few more questions of the panel, if they're going to, if they don't rush out of here, you can catch them before they leave. <laughs>